Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy to see everybody this morning. Glad you could be here today. Um, it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. And uh, I wanted to start with the birds this morning. Um, so uh, I learned just recently that without the birds singing, the, the ground would not be fertile enough to grow anything. Nothing grows in the ground without the birds singing. Now this was learned when um, there were some people in Africa and they were trying to grow things after there had been a devastating war and all of the bird life had been destroyed in that area and when they tried to grow things nothing would grow and somebody discovered and realized that it might have something to do with the birds they imported a bunch of birds and that was what allowed the seeds to be able to germinate in the soil so you know i i liken that to ourselves um we have to open up our voice we have to sing we have to speak we have to be our authentic self because without that um you you don't have the the fertile ground for growth in your life. Um, growth in your life requires that you speak your truth, that you be your authentic self. So I just wanted to start with that thought. That's our opening, our opening thought, is go out today and listen to the birds. Man, when I opened my ears this morning and, and listened to the birds singing in my yard, they were just like almost violent. They were just like so intense. You know, and that, that to me is why I love the spring. That's the first thing I that, heard when I had my hearing corrected. Oh. Yes, and the birds are so important. They're important to us. They're important to the land. So get out today and hear the birds. So um, we're going to start today with, um, I think we're going to start with our essential oil. Our essential oil today that we're going to talk about is the oil of frankincense. Now frankincense, as you know, is an oil that we read about in the scriptures, or at least it's a, a substance that we read about in the scriptures. When they use it in the scriptures, it's in the form of its resin or its sap, and they would use it as an incense, so they would burn it, which is different than how we use it in the oil. Nevertheless, it still has a lot of the same properties, and the oil of frankincense is so powerful in fact, it's called the king of oils. And that's, uh, to, it, it comes from the resin of a tree and it, that grows in the Middle East and, and other places. Um, but it, this, this oil that they call the king of oils, there's a reason why it's called that. And, and it's because it has so many medicinal and emotional and spiritual properties it just it's like it covers everything so if you're going to get one oil get frankincense now um, the oils that i use well frankincense anywhere you get it is going to be almost the most expensive oil it is fairly expensive but it's well worth it for what it does so some of the things that it does and in the handouts that i'll have in the description um, these cite many of the studies that have been done on frankincense oil and, and its benefits. Um, so I'm just going to list a few of those. Um, Anti-inflammatory, may reduce arthritis, may improve gut function, um, uh, it's actually medically prescribed to, create, to, to treat Crohn's symptoms. Um, uh, also with ulcerative colitis, it's helpful, um, can help treat chronic diarrhea, may improve asthma, um, helps it, it improves symptoms of and, manage and, and management of asthma and bronchitis. Um, it's uh, good for oral health, it has an, it's antibacterial. Um, it uh, is uh, good for gingivitis, it, it's anti-plaque, it has been used to help fight brain tumors, breast cancer, prostate cancer, 
pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, and melanoma. Um, it has anti-aging properties, antioxidant properties. Um, it's used in skin care, facial treatments. Um, uh, it is antibacterial, as I said before, and anti-inflammation. It's also antiseptic, um, cleans and disinfects um, wounds, and it's a natural astringent. Um, it's um, also used for um, for healing in the face, good for the skin, um, good for osteoarthritis, uh, good for your hair. I mean, can you see that that there are so many so many things in the 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 frankincense essential oil that it that it is beneficial for, and there have been many studies done on it. So I can I can recommend that, but I just I just took one website and some and some of the lists that they had, but there are plenty of websites that document a lot of the benefits of frankincense essential oil. So I highly recommend it. I love the oil, um, but also one of the most important things I think about it, uh, frankincense essential oil is its spiritual property. So anciently in the the ancient Hebrew temple they were commanded to take frankincense and burn the incense right before the door of the temple. So as they walked in, they would smell the frankincense. And frankincense is, uh, it's called the oil of truth uh, emotionally, but it's, it's an oil that is known to help you connect with your divine inspiration. So it like opens up your your ability to enlightening. to yeah it's enlightening it it opens up the channels of inspiration inside you, and um, frankincense also reveals deceptions and false truths. It invites individuals to let go of lower vibrations, lies, deceptions, and negativity. This oil helps create new perspectives based on light and truth. It uh, recalls to memory spiritual understanding, gifts, wisdom, and knowledge. Uh, some people call it the oil of the Father. Uh, it helps us to connect with God. It enhances practices of prayer and meditation, uh, opens spiritual channels, uh, allows us to connect with God. Through the light and power of frankincense, the individual can draw closer to divinity, healthy masculinity, and the grandeur of the true self. Powerful, powerful things that, that we learn from frankincense. So it's a good oil to get, a good oil, oil to learn from and use and, and learn about. And it, it directly ties into what we're going to talk about today. 360 degrees of healing. <laughs> right, right, very much so. So the stone we're going to talk about today um, I think goes well with uh, frankincense. This is called black tourmaline. It's a little bit shiny, um, and and it's got these long ridges down it, um, and very dark black. How do you say that again? But there are other colors of tourmaline. This is black tourmaline, okay. but there are other colors of it. Um, but this is the one I have. Um, it uh, is good to help detox from heavy metals, supports weight loss, supports reduction of anxiety and stress, supports the disengaging of obsessive behaviors, supports a healthy immune system, improves circulation, promotes a healthy mood. Um, it, uh, it, it, was, it was given to me some, some months ago um, as a recommendation to help release negativity. So in that way, it's going to support what we're going to talk about with frankincense and our spiritual concept today. So black tourmaline. Um, it's, I like to carry my stones sometimes in my pockets, um, in my purse, in my bag that I'm carrying. Uh, sometimes wear it as a necklace or, or anywhere I can get it, I, I'll, I'll carry it. Or if I'm just walking by, sometimes I'll just grab it. and. And if you're, if you're struggling with something and you pick up a stone, sometimes it will just, you know, give you sort of an immediate release of some of the tension because 
stones have that property of they've they've got um, they've got uh, electrons and protons and in, in there and and that exchange can happen between you and the stone. Is there the neutrons in there too? I believe so. And 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 as exchange happens um, between you and the stone, then you can be uh, blessed by the the properties of it. So anyway, that's why I use stones, or at least one of the reasons. Uh, okay, so today I'm I want to talk about um, something that I that I that I discovered and created uh, a couple of years ago um, when I was uh, talking to a group of people um, about self-improvement. And um, I was just doing some research and, and, uh, and, and I've always been a student of faith and trying to figure out what it is and how to use it and you know how I can actually put it in my hand and you know, make faith real to me. So in, in that process, um, I, I began to put, put symbols and ideas together into a mathematical formula. And that mathematical formula I now call the mathematics of the plan of salvation because it encompasses the basic simple plan of life and how we can Un maybe understand it better and maybe use it better. Like I said, I'm, I'm a student of faith and so that's kind of where it began. So I'm just gonna begin with that, the mathematics of the plan of salvation. So. What I'm gonna do is talk about some of the symbols that um, that I began to uh, put together in my mind that helped me make sense out of some of the concepts in the scriptures that we've been taught. So, you know what, Arch, I think there's some glare on that a little bit. Maybe we can no, turn can it, help it. it. You can see the words yeah. properly? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, um, basically, each concept introduced in this formula is given a symbol. Some symbols are mathematic and some symbols are Hebraic. In other words, they come from the Hebrew language. The idea here is to represent the gospel plan in something of a mathematical way in order to increase our understanding. So first we have the word Yod. Yod and for that symbol I will use the letter Y. Y for Yod. Is that Hebrew? Mm -hmm. Yod is a Hebrew word or for, it's a Hebrew word meaning word oh. or the word of God or a seed. So the, the Yod in Hebrew is actually this tiny little thing like that. And it means a seed or the word. So we learn in our scriptures that the word is the seed. Alma teaches us this in the Book of Mormon. He says, I will liken the word unto a seed. And in Hebrew, that's exactly what it is. The yod is a seed or the word. And so I'm going to use the letter Y so we can see it a little better. And it represents yod or the, the Hebrew letter for, for that. Yod. Y O D E. Y O D. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next we'll use three mathematical constants to represent three spiritual constants. So the first spiritual constant is faith. After receiving the word, we have the opportunity to exercise faith in that word, okay? So, um, the word the word times faith equals blessings. So if we have the word of God and we have faith in it, then we receive blessings. So that's kind of like a formula. So we'll use the symbol of pi to represent faith. 
pi. So pi is a constant used to determine the area or the circumference of a circle. 3.14. Right, so if we have a circle, so pi times the diameter or pi times r squared, that will determine either our circumference or the area. So pi is, is, a, is a constant that's used to determine what's in the circle. And, uh, and so pi times the diameter equals the circumference. And to me, this is similar to the exercise of our faith. When we hear the word and we exercise our faith in the, that constant, then we receive according to that faith. So what, what we receive is, is basically what's in the circle. So the second constant that we're going to introduce here is hope. That's the spiritual concept. The symbol for hope I have chosen is phi. And P-H-I. P-H-I. So phi is this funny little symbol here. Wow. I think that's right. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so phi, so we have pi and phi. <laughs> pi and phi. <laughs> pi and phi. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so phi is the golden mean. Phi is the ratio of perfect growth in nature. Hope is the principle of expectation through faith in Christ. If our life has been good in small things through small amounts of obedience, then we can expect through hope that greater and greater obedience will also receive greater and greater blessings. That's what hope really is. It's that, that hope that there will be more. Hope in a better world. Hope in Christ. Hope in in something, an eternal reward, that's, that's the, the, the golden mean of growth as, as a spiritual concept. So we have growth in life that is phi, which is the, the golden mean, which is the ratio by which everything grows. So if you, they, they represent this by a, uh, a snail shell. A snail shell will grow exactly according to the golden mean by ra that ratio. It's a ratio of two different numbers. And, and that is exactly consistent with our hope. As we hope in Christ, as we have faith, then our hope and our faith grow and so do our blessings and they grow in exact proportion to that. So that's why I chose that symbol. Okay, so Fascinating. The, the third concept a uh, spiritual concept is charity. Faith, hope, charity. Um, the true, pure love of Christ is what charity is. And we are going to use the constant one for charity. So um, in mathematics, one represents identity and unity. These are both ample representations of God's perfect love, identity and unity. So God is love. It is his identity. It's who he is. He is unity. And when we are unified with God, we are one. And he always describes himself as one. So I, I think one amply represents charity here. Okay. So then, now we have those three constants. Right? That's probably the golden mean. What is it? The golden mean, one, and pi. Pi, phi, and one. Okay, so now to finish out our equation, in order to understand the whole plan, we are going to add um, the, the other principles or practices that God gives us. One, uh, the next one is prayer or communion with God. 
And this is represented by <clears throat> the symbol U or union. So in mathematics, that symbol U represents union. And in our in our belief, in our philosophy, in our understanding of the gospel, prayer means to commune or be one with God, to commune, to to communicate, to to be united with him. And we talk about it as being united in prayer and we commune with God, meaning we we are talking to him. It, it was like, like bringing us together. Knitting okay. our hearts together. Right. So the next concept is um, the infinite set or God himself. God who is divine, infinite, and all-encompassing, I represent here by the uh, symbol for infinite set. And that is this. Is it called infinite what? The infinite set. In mathematics, this is the symbol for the infinite set. It looks like a sideways eight. It just represents infinity because it just keeps going back and forth and back and forth. And that is it is what I will use to represent God in this equation. The, uh, the next symbol that we have is the symbol of the kingdom of God. The kingdom, oh, excuse me. Excuse me, I left one out. And I'm slightly out of order here. Okay, the next one is not the kingdom, it's Tumim. So Tumim is a Hebrew word for perfect or wholehearted commitment. Now when God says to be perfect, he's really talking about the condition of our hearts, meaning fully committed. So he's not talking about what we do. And if you read the Hebrew at all, you would understand this. Hebraically speaking, that word has to do with the condition of your heart and how committed you are. So when he says be perfect, he's merely saying be all the way committed. Be completely in for God. And so that's what I'm going to put next. How do you spell that? <clears throat> Tumim. T-H-U-M-M-I-M. Tumim. It's the Hebrew word. And I'm going to use the Hebrew letter Tav uh, to represent that. Next. So we are going to put the Tav right here. I hope that's right. No, I'm, well, I'm close. Okay, so that's the Tav, and it represents Tumim, or wholeheartedness. And then the last one is the kingdom of God, which can be understood as all that the Father hath, or every good thing. And uh, the symbol in mathematics for this is the universal set or everything. So we're going to put the equal sign here and we're going to put the universal set here. Uh, goes the other way. The universal set. Every good thing. What was that one again right before it? That's two mean, the Tav. T-H-U-M-M-U-I-M, two mean. Okay. okay, so now we're gonna put all this together so we can understand this better and how it works in our lives. Okay, so the word times these together, faith, hope, and charity. So God teaches us in the scriptures that unless we have faith, hope, and charity, then we're nothing. We don't, we don't have anything. So you can't just have the word and then not use it with faith, hope, and charity. Empty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's empty. It's just empty words unless you put your faith, hope, and charity in it. Okay, so the word times faith, hope, and charity um, times true prayer uniting with God um, to receive personal revelation from God with wholehearted commitment equals the universal set, every good thing. So this is basically the formula to 
enter into the kingdom, as it were, and to receive every good thing. I mean, we want every good thing right now. We want health, we want happiness, we want peace, we want love, we want companionship, we want safety, we want, we want good things in our life, we want comf comfort, we want all those good things. And God says, if you take the word and believe it and have faith, hope, and charity, and pray, and receive personal revelation from God, be united with him, and do all of this with a wholehearted commitment, then every good thing is yours. Is that in the copy or should I write that down? Uh, it's, it's in the, uh, I will put it in the handouts okay. that you can print out, but you may want to write it down. But the, the most important thing now is how this formula works mathematically and spiritually. Because this is in the end, now that we have this formula, that's great. I think anybody could recognize that from the scriptures. But sometimes we don't recognize that we are sabotaging the formula. And that's what I am going to illustrate today. So, so now we are actually going to uh, write another formula that's going to help you understand the relationship between this and what we are sometimes doing that might sabotage this. So, so we're going to write another formula, and this formula is the, basically the opposite or the, the antithesis of this formula. So, the first one is lies. Lies, or the philosophies of men mingled with scripture. This is represented by the symbol is not a member of. Okay, and that symbol is this, like that. It means is not in or is not a member of. So if, you're, if, if there are lies, then you're not the truth, basically. So that's what this represents, not the truth. And it's exactly converse to the, the, the word of God we have up here, which is the truth. So we have I the truth, say that. or we have not the truth. In okay. conflict with God. Okay, so is not in, is not a member of, and I think that's highly symbolic. Okay, then, then we have, so we have lies, and then we have unbelief. So I'll put this here, so you can, lies, and then the second one is unbelief, and unbelief I will represent here by negative one, as in a non-belief in God. So if God is represent or if charity is represented by one or unity or oneness or um, that the concept of charity, then unbelief is the negating of that or a negative one. So we'll times a negative one. And the next one is doubt, and it's here represent by, represented by the constant zero, as in doubt casts out every good thing. It is no good thing. Doubt is zero or no good thing. So we'll put zero there. So we have lies, unbelief, and doubt. And the next um, constant um, that we're going to introduce is fear. And fear here I will represent by the letter I, which in mathematics is the set of imaginary numbers. So fear is um, basically creating something that's not true in your mind and, and fearing it. It's, it's, it. It doesn't exist but we are afraid of it anyway, because God and truth and light and love, those things do exist. Lies do not exist. We, we sometimes create the illusion that they do, but, but only the truth exists. And fear is, something, is our reaction to lies. So that's why 
sphere I represent here as the set of imaginary numbers. Okay, so fear is um, is uh, is the great sin. It is the setting up of imaginary gods as opposition to God. It's basically idolatry. So the I is also appropriate there. So then um, the next symbol we have here, so if we have faith, hope, and charity, we have unbelief, doubt, and fear down here that we are going to take our lies and combine it with in that formula. So now, instead of union with God down here through prayer and the receipt of per personal revelation, there are empty words. And the mathematical sim symbol for the empty word is E. And it is a valid mathematical symbol, the empty word. Prayers are seemingly not answered because the heart is not in the prayer. Thus, it is empty. Empty word. Okay? And then, um, so instead of uniting with God eternally, we just have the empty word, and that's going to go for both of these symbols here. And the next one, instead of um, wholehearted commitment, which is the tunim, or perfect, we will have hypocrisy, which is represented mathematical, mathematically by an empty box. The empty box. Okay? Hypocrisy is when half-hearted seeks to represent itself as wholehearted by performing and demonstrating its works before men to be seen of them. It is pretense having a false front that appears correct while the heart is empty of any good. So the empty box in mathematics represents, is opposite to the, the wholehearted, where it's a full heart. So this is an empty heart. And then at the end, the result here, instead of the kingdom of God, the result of this equation is the empty set, or no good thing. Now, the empty set looks like this. No good thing. It's, it's a zero with a line through it. Basically, there's nothing at all, ever. <laughs> and we learn in the scriptures that that the adversary has no good thing to offer us. There, there is, he, he has no good thing. There's just, he doesn't have anything. And that's what that is represented by. Okay, so, now, now we're going to see how this works mathematically, so you can understand how it works spiritually. So now we're going to try to put in the numbers for pi, phi, and 1 into our equation. So together, these three numbers, and, and they have a mathematical value, but together they equal approximately 7. So we're going to put a 7 there, just, just for our purposes today. Okay, and that might seem small, 7, but when you consider that the Word of God is infinite and that the power of true prayer is also infinite and um, and that God himself and uniting with him is infinite then you realize that even our small contribution is going to end up being infinite in the end when you take anything at all times God's infinite. So, again? so with God, all things are possible. That's how God puts it. And here, even if we have a tiny contribution of, say, five or six or seven, when you take that times 
the infinite and the infinite and the infinite, then you have infinite, okay? Now, let's see what really happens in our lives. So if we take any one of these things, lies, unbelief, doubt, fear, um, empty heart, and the E, which was um, which was empty words. Okay, so if you take any one of these, let's just say we take uh, doubt and put it into our equation here, okay? So let's put doubt in here instead of um, uh, hope. So if we take out hope and we put in doubt, even if we've got all the other stuff in there, so in an equation, if you put, if you put a zero in here and you take the infinite times pi times zero, what is the rest e of the equation going to look like? If you put a zero right in here. So any of you, anybody who knows mathematics realizes very quickly that if you put a zero in this equation instead of a two or a three or a five, that you are going to get zero for the rest of the equation. Because anything times zero is zero. So if you take the infinite times zero, you get zero. Times infinite, you get zero. Times infinite, you get zero. Times anything, you get zero. So let's do it with the negative one. The same thing works. If you put a negative one instead of this, then you now have a negative number and you are not getting, you're, you're getting a zero at the end. You're getting nothing that is of a positive value. So basically anything in this equation that we try and put into this equation is going to cancel out the good that we're getting. So sometimes we in the gospel think that God is failing us, or that maybe we're just not, you know, good enough, or God doesn't love us enough, or we haven't waited long enough, or we maybe just need to, you know, go to church a few more years or something. But when I when I put this to, this equation together, I realized that even one fear, one doubt, one moment of unbelief can cancel out my equation. So I want to read you a scripture that I found in the book of Revelation that was rather surprising because I had always thought that that um, it was it was people who were openly and blatantly wicked who would be um, suffering in hell. Um, but according to God and according to the book of Revelation, um, he says, hopefully I can find it here, um, help me Archer. Anyway, it's in there. I will find it and I will put it in the comments. But it says that the fearful and unbelieving first. The fearful, unbelieving, and, and, and then he says the liars, the adulterers, the sorcerers, the whoremongers. But the fearful and unbelieving were the first ones on the list to be cast into hell. And I thought, well... Fear, unbelief, are those really that bad of sins? But when you look at your equation, 
If you take doubt and try to put it in your equation, you've canceled all your good. Doubt and fear cast out every good thing in your life. And so if we, if we harbor, if we hold on to our fears and our doubts and our unbelief and, and our hatred and any of those negative things that we want to put into our e good equation, they are canceling out our good. So, thank you. Arja has found it for me. Revelation 21, verse eight. Verse eight. It was right there. Good number, 21, 21. 21, <laughs> 21 verse eight in Revelation. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Yeah, that seems a little harsh, but when you realize that doubt and fear and unbelief can cast out every good thing in your life, then it makes you, makes you maybe think twice. So, so how do you cast out doubt, fear, and unbelief? Well, that was pretty much what our class was about last week. It's about learning how to, to refine your soul and cleanse yourself of maybe bad habits and bad thoughts and bad, bad beliefs that you've had or incorrect beliefs. But I would say the most important thing we can do to heal ourselves of doubt, fear, and unbelief is to, is to search scriptures to love scriptures, to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I've, I've been a little bit um, just concerned by, by how little people discuss and love and immerse themselves in the scriptures. The scriptures are literally our lifeline. And when you immerse yourself in them, then the truth washes over you and heals you of the doubts and the fears and the unbeliefs that you have. They are the things that cleanse you. They are the things that change you as, you as you read them, as you study them, as you believe them, as you trust them, then they are the things that heal your life. This is basically Christ in your life because, because Christ is truth. So, yes? I remember the scripture from fifth grade and memorizing for the uh, different things to put on it. What was it called that they had us for? On your banner, yeah. Um, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you just nicely said that. Yes, the, the scriptures testify of Christ, and they bring us to Christ. And, and you know, it's, it, it's I, I can't stress the importance of this enough. And there is so much in here that God wants us to know but we have to get the first level before we can get the next level. So read it, and then read it again, and then, and then search it. So what I do is uh, I started by searching the scriptures with a dictionary. So, for instance, if I was reading this verse in, in Revelation, I would look up the word abominable and figure out what it meant in 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 my dictionary and i had a good excuse me i had a good um etymological dictionary that gave the the etymology of the word a little bit and it it said it would say well this came from the latin this and the greek that and and it would give me a, a greater insight and that that was how i first started to really study my scriptures besides just reading them and maybe cross-referencing I started to study the words and que I questioned my understanding of the words. Uh, words can be, words can change over time and people's use of words can t change over time. And we've had these words intact for several hundred years and, and people's understanding of different words have changed over time. So as you look into the historical background of a word it can it can change your view of how you understand it and how you live it and uh, you know God says that he tries the faith of his people in other words he gives us things that maybe are a little bit cryptic a little bit difficult a little bit challenging so that we will do our homework and figure it out and study it and ask him and 
go to him in prayer and 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 learn and 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 grow in our understanding of this and i promise you if you do that god will open up these books to you and they will mean more and they will literally bring you life and make it so that you can walk through this equation without stumbling and without dropping down into the other and trying to bring something into that equation that doesn't belong there. And I only learned that from studying these words. So I want to thank you all for coming today. It's been a great day, and I'm so looking forward to seeing you all again. So have a great day.